and I think there was a lot of alcohol involved in the political system in Kentucky where bourbon was basically the lifeblood of the economy along with tobacco and horse racing. <laughs> Definitely our kind of state. <laughs> so one day, I'm assuming it was real hot, uh, Augustus Alexander Stanley's opponent speaks, and Augustus Alexander Stanley comes to the front of the stage, realizes he's had a lot too much to drink, turns around and throws up all over the stage, and he returns to the front of the stage and he says, gentlemen, you will have to excuse me. Every time I hear my opponent speak, it makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty elegant. That's, that's an elegant mind, okay? So, so Bear's father, who was Augustus Housley Stanley Jr., right, was dwarfed by his father. But at the age of 37, he enlisted in the United States Navy in World War II. He was serving on the USS Lexington during the Battle of the Coral Sea, which is the only naval battle in history where the ships never saw each other. But the level of destruction was incomprehensible, actually. And the USS Lexington, the aircraft carrier in which he was serving, was blown apart and sank beneath him. He survived. He returned to Washington. He became a lifelong alcoholic who was a lawyer who spent his entire career working for the federal government. Small Business Administration. So this is where Bear comes from. And right from the very beginning, Bear never fit. I mean, he was the ultimate rebel with and without a cause, the, you know, the square peg that couldn't fit into the round hole. I mean, but he was a brilliant child. At the age of three and a half, he taught himself how to read by looking at comic books and seeing the letters as ideographs. I'm trying to give you a sense of his brain. He never, it was years before he could use a dictionary because he didn't understand the order of the alphabet. He saw letters as pictures and then could read the words. He went to live, he was sent. <laughs> His parents divorced. The father sent him to live in LA with the mother. The mother couldn't control him, sent him back to the father. The father sent him to Charlotte Hall, I think the oldest private military academy in America. Uh, that's where Bear got his nickname because he was 13. And he had a hairy chest, which I guess the rest of them didn't have. Uh, and he lasted not too long because on a, like a homecoming weekend, he got the entire student body drunk <laughs> at 13. And they threw him out of that school. Then he went to the high school that helped me, Shirley McLean and Warren Beatty went to. Does that make sense? Okay. Couldn't live with his father. Father couldn't live with him. At the age of 15, I think because he was offered this option, uh, Bear became a voluntary patient at St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital in Washington, D.C. Also confined there at the time was the poet Ezra Pound, who had been brought back to America after World War II to be tried as a traitor, because he, while living in Italy, had spoken against America, made rapidly anti-Semitic remarks, and instead of putting this quote-unquote old man in jail for the rest of his life, they found him to be crazy, and they put him in St. Elizabeth's, okay, with Bear. Pound spent seven years in the institution, and when he emerged, he was asked his opinion of his native land, and Pound said, all America is a lunatic asylum. <laughs> That's what this book is about. It took me a long time. Just to track briefly, not to give away the goods here, but you know, so then Bear, what does he do? He lists in the Air Force, and then he leaves the Air Force, and he works as a rocket test engineer, and he works in TV, and he works in radio, and none of it is really anything. And he goes to see the Bolshoi Ballet, the first time they tour America in 1958. He's so blown away by the lead ballet dancer, a man, that he goes to talk to him, but the guy doesn't speak English. Bear becomes starts studying Russian, becomes fluent in Russian, and starts taking two ballet lessons a day at the age, at an age where you have no business even trying to, <laughs> to do a lift or a jeté or wear a tutu or any of the above. Okay? So he comes up to Berkeley. Now we go NorCal. He's taking classes. He's been a student of everything and nothing for a long time. He's been married twice, been divorced twice. He's been jailed for a variety of minor charges, kind of really dumb, petty stuff, you know. And in Berkeley, gee, what a shock, he 
takes acid for the first time. Okay? And he has a real trip, but it's not until he takes a half a cap of Sando that he realizes what acid really is. And for those of you who lived through this and remember, and those of you who didn't, uh, Sando's Pharmaceutical is based in Basel in Switzerland. And in 1938, a research chemist named Albert Hoffman uh, was searching to create a respiratory and circulatory stimulant. He came up with the 25th derivative of lysergic acid, LSD-25, and abandoned. Five years later, he was going to revisit it. He accidentally ingested some, tripped, and three days later took the first intentional acid trip. In history, bicycle did. Took 250 milligrams and had to ride home in a bicycle because it was the war in Switzerland and there was fuel ration. This is information that I have retained that has no value <laughs> whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's LSD trivia. Okay. So, so the only way, the only way, and this will be shocking, that you could get Sandoz back then, here's you could get Dr. Humphrey Osman, who was working with alcoholics in Canada, who coined the term psychedelic. He could get it. Dr. Oscar Janiger, who gave LSD to a thousand patients, among them Anais Nin and Cary wow. Grant, he could access it. Timothy Leary, who was involved with the Harvard Psychedelic Project, and obviously at Harvard, he could get it. But no one on the street who didn't have a serious academic or medical connection was able to obtain Sandoz until Owsley took it and then went to Bancroft Library, where he spent two weeks with his girlfriend, Melissa Cargill, who was a research chemist, studied research chemistry. He read all the existing literature on LSD. And then he decided that he could make it. Okay? And no disrespect to Walter White. No. Making LSD is not like cooking meth, where you blow up the kitchen in the Salinas Valley and then you go do it someplace else. It's an incredibly complicated process. LSD is incredibly fragile. It's subject to temperature change and can't be, you know, can't come into contact with water, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Owsley somehow, and he goes through other phases. He, first he's making methadrine and then he's making stuff that's inert, and then he starts buying the crystalline powder, and it's still really hard. Anyway, comes back to Berkeley in 65 from LA with 800,000 doses of the purest LSD that's ever been synthesized on the street. They cost $3 a piece. And as he said, because Bear, as the great John Barlow once said, had a really interesting concept of how famous he wanted to be. He managed his own fame in the most bizarre bear-like manner imaginable, okay? Uh, not letting anyone take his photograph, but the way his name got out there was that he sold some in L.A. to a really well-known Berkeley folk guitarist named Harry Letterman, who then resold it and said to people, here, this is Owsley. So the name, his middle name, became the name of the LSD, and touchingly, one of the things that Bear was proudest of was that if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, Owsley is listed as a synonym for a very pure form of acid, one of the few proper names that have become a noun. Okay. So now he knows how to do this. I'd like to interject. Just please speak up. Ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce yes, you yes. to my good friend and associate, John it. Terry Barton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the size of the brain. He gets so obsessive about this 
that he won't use beakers and glassware that haven't been <laughs> hand blown for him in Berkeley by a guy who's just making stuff for Alice. And the only great thing since I'm in the company of those who have journeyed far beyond. So I said, Bear, what's it like? He said, well, you know, when you work with it, you ingest it. You can't avoid it. If you wear gloves, you wear a smock, you wear it, it doesn't matter. I mean, he used to drop it from a murine bottle in your eye, and you would be tripping much faster than if you had taken a tap, because it's right in your bloodstream. So I said, what's it? Well, he said, why well, after three days, you kind of have to back off a little bit. <laughs> but then after two weeks, it doesn't make a difference anymore which speaks to the level at which Owsley ingested his own, got high on his own supply, right? So what I wanted to say back when he discussed it, I wanted to go Steely Dan, Kid Charlemagne. Owsley crossed the diamond with the pearl. He turned it on the world. And that was when he turned the world around. And the way he did that was driving back into town for the human being. January 1967, he sees the poster. says, hey, let's call this new batch White Lightning because there is a lightning bolt on the human being poster. All the acid taken in Golden Gate Park that day is Owsley's white lightning. Now we come to Monterey Pop, okay? Uh, Mama Cass, who has already taken some Owsley acid to the Beatles in London, says, listen, we're going to, you know, will you make it happen? And he says, don't worry, you'll have enough LSD to make the festival work. Shows up with what comes to be called Monterey Purple. Almost all the acid taken at Monterey Pete Townsend takes a dose, and it's so powerful that he doesn't take acid again for 18 years. <laughs> and he says of Owsley, he, he was like the king's taster. Whatever he gave you, he took to, he must have had the most extraordinary liver, which I guess he did, you know, no doubt about it. So, from Monterey Pop, Owsley sends a camera case packed with purple acid, to John Lennon. Lennon is terrified that he's going to run out of LSD and he will not be able to write songs in. <laughs> and he wants to have a lifetime supply of Owsley, okay? And he gets it. The Beatles trip constantly for the next three weeks. And then they make Magical Mystery Tour. I'm trying to give you a sense of the power of this one man in this era, okay? Three nights after uh, Monterey Pop, Owsley walks over to Jimi Hendrix backstage at Fillmore West. God only knows how high Hendrix is at this point. Owsley sure. gives him some DMT in a pipe. They both smoke DMT. And Owsley tells Hendrix, I want to record you solo. Fine. Next night, they go to this room with a fireplace. God knows how stoned they are. They're so loaded. Hendrix plays all night. Owsley records it. They pull open the drapes. The sun is shining. Owsley's got the most amazing, no one's ever got one. Henry says, hey man, can I see that? He takes the cassette and he throws it in the fire. Cassette burns. So, I'm thinking this story can't be true. Come on. Guys took too much ass. If you listen to the Hendricks at the BBC, recorded nine months later, he's doing Day Tripper. And in the break, he calls out, oh Owsley, can you hear me now? This is one guy. Okay, and then he gets busted, and then he goes, he does two years in federal, you know. Okay, more insanity. He's at Terminal Island, the dead come to play at Terminal Island. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody searches the road cases. <laughs> and the roadies are all stoned on acid, and they're setting up in prison. And the first song they play is Truckin', which is, you know, the bad bus for Owsley was the one in New Orleans, set up like a bullet. And that's the one I got him sent in. When he comes back out, he doesn't make acid again. God knows how much he's got stashed in a variety of places. Does sound, well, uh, you know, I, I could stand here for an hour and talk about uh, the wall of sound, you know, the sound he did for the dead. Uh, I, I tell you what, with this group, many as you are, and, ex and as experienced as you all are, uh, I'm going to read. Tell them about the Ice Age. Um, okay. <laughs> so, Bear has, this is, now we've jumped ahead. He's grown weed in Marin, and he's done sound for the airplane, and all that. He's not with the dead anymore. Has this recurring dream, night after night after night after night. 
don't ask. It's too complicated for me to explain. It goes into Egyptian mythology and the seasons of the when the Nile would flood. And you know, I don't know, man. I'm the Jewish guy from Brooklyn. I don't go that far. But okay. So he decides that the ice age storm is coming. That's going to destroy the entire northern hemisphere. No one will be left alive. This is the storm of Noah coming back. It's not global warming. It's a whole different thing. It's like almost global colding. It's like the ice and the, ba the bay of Baffin Bay. I don't know. Okay. And he decides that people will only survive in Australia. And I actually spoke with somebody yesterday on the radio who was there. He assembles all these people at Phil Lesh's house. He speaks. Okay. Bob Weir back in the day, Weir met Owsley while he was on Owsley. No. And he said, if somebody's sitting there, yeah. there. Oh, it's Sherilyn. Sherilyn, somebody said. Uh, um, yeah. Bob Weir said, back then, if you were going to talk to Owsley, you had better pack a lunch. <laughs> Bear did not speak. Line. He didn't speak. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we have people claiming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, Bear could really talk, okay? And so he harangued everybody in this house, and then he passed out visas. They all should move with him to Australia. He wound up moving. He squatted on 160 acres in the middle, middle of nowhere. John Barlow visited him and described it as being something out of Lord Jim. Yeah. He had a, a one-man thing here that was Victorian in its flavor. It, was, it had no walls. <laughs> it had a roof. But it had Persian carpeting everywhere, large potted birds and fine Victorian the reason that he put it there was because he had realized that uh, both the Great, Bar Great Barrier Reef and the Dane Treaty Rainforest right next to it had survived the last seven ice ages. Mm -hmm. He lived in the rainforest. were highly likely to survive the, the next one. And, uh, point this out in the book because he hadn't wound up dying in a rainstorm in Australia. <laughs> So before I read from this book, we have another fabulous guest. It's a really big show tonight. I'm going to introduce some people in the audience. Some really special guests. I'm going to ask him to tell the story that I didn't put in the book, and I was asked about it yesterday on Tales of the Golden Road. We have with us, ladies and gentlemen, San Francisco's own Joel Selden. Garcia's 
Or Garcia. Oh, there's tons of those guys. I mean, Country Joe's is hilarious. It's all redacted. There's like like two sentences that you can read, but there's like 22 pages. <laughs> uh, so what did this lead you to believe? Well, no. Well, who gets their files redacted? Well, the redact Fine. blacked out is one thing, but yeah, this, these are gone. These are just these disappeared, are gone. right? You know, and 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 you know, Owsley spoke Russian. He was in the Air Force, and you know. Owsley was Owsley, too. I'm mean, sitting here listening to you talk, you know, and it's, a, it's so interesting. You make him sound like an ordinary human being. He wasn't. He <laughs> was not. There wasn't anybody like him ever. It was not. Ever. And, uh, you know, yeah, a spy. I mean, that's the only possible, really, you know, explanation. If you can, if you can think of another one, let me know. Or, or, I couldn't know, put it in the book. Facebook. I couldn't put it in the book. I could have put it in the book, but, uh, uh, you know. All the terms are holy. I mean, the only thing is, there's a good case of the devil angel. Yeah. Or devil angel. He, Triple, even, quadruple, yeah. Even though he did speak Russian and was fluent, well, you know what? Everything he told, everything he said could have been a lie because he never would have been posted to Andrews Air Force Base in the Mojave because they didn't have the kind of satellite capability back then where you could be listening to the Russians. It's, it, but who knows? Who knows where he was posted? Where the where the FBI file go? You tell me. Okay. And then, you know, you gotta, you, I'm I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm all ears. I offer this only on Hate Street. I'm gonna take a question. Let him read. Let him read. I am. Not, let him read. Let the kid. Read. Let the kid read. Huh? So this is the uh, what we call the prologue, and actually, in his journey, this is where it all begins for Ben. This is the real beginning. Uh, the title is The Muir BHS, it says. Amid all the swirling madness being created by Ken Kesey and his band of merry pranksters in the Muir Beach Lodge on Saturday, December 11, 1965, one thing is eminently clear. The guy who supplied all the high-octane rocket fuel powering this event is definitely freaking out. Everyone knows this because for what feels like hours but has only been about 10 or 15 minutes, He's been making the most horrible screeching and scraping noises imaginable by dragging an old wooden chair back and forth across the floor. Had he been doing this at one of the wedding receptions that regularly take place here in this 100-foot log cabin, someone would have already long since asked him to stop because this is an acid test where everyone is tripping on LSD and there are no rules. No one is about to do anything about it even though the sound is driving everybody up the proverbial wall. On every level imaginable, the guy has already had himself quite an evening. Having never taken, having never before taken acid with the pranksters at a full-blown acid test, he has seen the Grateful Dead perform for the first time. Accompanied by a flashing strobe, a light machine, and a home movie that was being shown by two projectors at once, the sound of Jerry Garcia's lead guitar wrapped itself around the guy's mind like the claws of a tiger. Initially terrified, he then had the stunning revelation that would shape the rest of his life. The Grateful Dead are not just good, they are fantastic. Someday they're going to be even bigger than the Beatles. Although the guy has no idea how he can help them accomplish this goal, what he wants to do now is to hitch a ride with the most amazing group he has ever seen and somehow make a positive contribution to their future. While all this might already have been more than enough for anyone else, the LSD he has taken combined with the weirdness of the prankster's current sound interval, suddenly meshed to send him off somewhere that he has never before been. Losing all control of his body, he finds himself trapped in an endless spiral of utterly fantastic scenes. As Tom Wolfe will later write in the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, this guy has now been transported back to the 18th century, where he sees himself as a, quote, alchemist, seer, magician, master of precognition, forecaster of lotteries, stuck in a dank dungeon in the Bastille, which itself then shatters into fragments as he loses all of his skin and then his entire skeleton as well. With his whole substance dissolving into gaseous nothingness, he becomes a single cell, quote, one human cell, his. That was all that was left of the entire known world. And if he lost control of that one cell, there would be nothing left. The world would be like over making the guy's current plight yet even more dire, one of the pranksters geometrically increases his paranoia by pointing out some conventionally dressed guests who might well be the police. Although LSD is still legal in California, 
the guy is holding so much of it at the moment that he decides the time has come for him to split the scene and get the hell out of there just as fast as he possibly can. Running out the door, he leaps behind the wheel of his car and begins driving madly along the narrow, winding road leading away from the Muir Beach Lodge. In no condition to drive, much less do anything else, he promptly runs his car into a ditch. Abandoning the vehicle, he charges back into the lodge and does something that is completely unthinkable on every level imaginable by confronting the incredibly powerful and charismatic Ken Kesey about what is going on here tonight. In no uncertain terms, the guy tells the noted author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, who is also the peerless and unchallenged leader of the Merry Pranksters, that he and his cohorts are messing around with something they do not understand. Taking LSD in this kind of wildly out of control group situation in order to awaken the part of the unconscious mind that used to be defined as containing all of the angels and devils is extremely dangerous. And since it is the guy's LSD that made all this happen, he is going to ensure that tonight's acid test will be the last one ever held by cutting off their supply. Laughing off everything that the guy is saying to him, Kesey responds to the diatribe by pinning a badge on the guy's shirt. Precisely why Kesey has chosen to do this, no one knows. Offended by the act, the guy's girlfriend promptly removes the badge, only to have Kesey take it away from her. In true prankster fashion, Kesey says, no, no. He gets to decide if he wants to wear it or not. And then he puts the badge right back on the guy's shirt. Due to the overwhelming popularity of the electric Kool-Aid acid test, Tom Wolfe's account of this freakout soon becomes the stuff of legend. In the book, Wolfe, who himself had never taken LSD, somehow manages to convey the all-out careening madness that acid can sometimes induce even in the mind of not just the most experienced user, but also someone whom Grateful Dead bassist Phil Lesh will later describe as the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. As the man in question Born Augustus Owsley Stanley III, but then known to one and all simply as Owsley, will later say, quote, Frank says we're playing around with Wolf and he didn't have a clue. He didn't realize who and what they were. Nothing about me in that book was accurate. It was what other people said about me. I never met Wolf, and the man never talked to me. So it was all his fantasy about it, or someone else's fantasy about it. But then in the world, according to Augustus Owsley Stanley III, only he was ever right all the time. Thank you. <laughs> was the famous um, first uh, LSD trip of the Beatles, was that Owsley acid that they took? So, because then it When they were to... dosed in that club in the coffee? Yeah. I can't say for sure. I think it was Hollingsworth. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. So Leary sent, Michael Hollingsworth wrote a book called The Man Who Turned Around the World. It turned out to be Jesus Christ. He was wandering around the planet. He was. Brilliant, that's exactly right. He was sent to London by Leary and he created the World Psychedelic Center, I would think. But that was Sandoz. That, uh, Hollingsworth had gotten it from Sandoz. There was no place Holling's where he could get it. Holling's head. Holling's head. Holling's head. Sorry, how was right there. There was no word. Michael Hollingshead. Thank you, sir. So, Thank you. anybody else? I hope. Yes. So, framed by what Joel said, um, you go very quickly in the book by uh, Owsley gets this knowledge right. of being able to make it, but it's the hardest thing in the world right. to synthesize. No Nobody idea. else can do it. I have no He's, idea. Okay, but, I mean, but you got to wonder a little bit by Sasha Shulgin. Does, does right. anybody, somebody Sasha have, Shulgin was a serious chemist. Okay, here's what I mean. Melissa Cargill, she had the tools. She knew how to do the stuff practically. What Owsley always said is, I'm not a chemist, I'm a cook. You could, it's a recipe. You can bake it up. What he had was, as John could tell you, or anybody who ever met him, told, the most one-pointed, compulsive, obsessive, compulsive. He could, folk, if he was fixing a wire in the middle of Dark Star with Jerry's, Jerry was going to wait until he fixed the wire. Nothing could just... So I think it was that focus, with the knowledge and with her practical, and his desire to make it. So you don't think someone popped? You don't think someone? No one could have. 
No one could. Sasha Shogun wasn't. It's 1965, bro. He came back from LA in 65 with 800,000 doses. There was nobody. I mean, you know, it's whole. There was no internet. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't yeah, call. Couldn't that's call. That's just, that's just It seems like it's sort of common knowledge that uh, Magical Mystery Tour was you know, influenced by acid. So how much earlier than that w was the first episode with LSD with the Beatles? In other words, Sgt. Pepper or... Good question. No, no, no. no. I you keep going back. Yes. Ball, 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 rubber Soul. Rubber Soul? Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rubber Soul is the first acid album. You can hear it. I mean, as soon as you hear George playing sitar, you know they took acid. <laughs> 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 no English boys in London were playing sitar until they took acid. So yeah, so yeah, they've been using it, and Lennon is terrified that they're going to run out. You know, and, and, I mean, Magical Mystery Tour is completely easy. It's their version of the bus. You know, they're on the road and they're on the road in, in England. And how about the influence on the Stones? I mean, um, Jagger sort of portrayed in methodological terms or not as being kind of a control freak. And not it's, being, a really, it's a really good question. Or were they also in acid as much? Okay, so, you know, Jagger is the great shapeshifter, and so the Stones make their psychedelic album. Uh, the first Satanic Majesty. Thank you. It's one of 10,000 light years from home. Damn the Lion, you know. Roundly considered to be the worst album the Stones have ever made, right out there. Terrible. They, they're laughed at. You well, know, they're, they think they're it is. Yeah. They, yeah, they, they, they think they're not down. There's a lot of good music on it, but they're, you know, they're, they're following the Beatles. The Stones' love, peace, and flowers thing was already over because they got busted first. Keith got busted. The rumor being that Marianne Faithful, I can't only, I'm so happy to be working here today. The rumor being that uh, when the cops broke into Keith's house, Redlands, uh, Marianne Faithful had a Mars bar soaked in LSD between her legs. <laughs> Can't make shit like that. I mean, you have to make stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> None of it was true. Right. Winter without albums. <laughs> Winter without, without albums. I've never checked that. Before. I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the Stones. The Stones. See, Brian Jones. Was, <laughs> Brian Jones was at Monterey Pop. Brian Jones is the one who turned Keith on to acid. Brian Jones and Anita. But this is 65, 64, 65, and it's the English acid thing, which is very much to do with fashion. Tangiers. It's more, you know, there's no war. I, I had somebody ask me in another one of these about acid and different cultures. And there was somebody there who was uh, Swedish. And, uh, I was actually at the Henry Miller Library, Magnus Torin. And, you know, in England, they dropped acid and they walked around like peacocks on King's Road. In Germany, they dropped acid and they became the Bader Meinhof gang. And they blew people up and robbed banks. So, you know, Leary talked about set and setting. The drug itself, what it does to you, it's a lot like what it is you were looking for it to do you. Yes, sir? Um, I remember reading a long time ago about the, the evolution of the consciousness beyond acid and beyond further, beyond further. You know, I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Well, 1965 is 50 some years later, right. and, and we're still traveling. We're beyond further, and we're beyond acid, and what is, where is your consciousness well, I, gone? I, I thank you. It's a great question. I mean, in that period, I was late for all this, but what seemed to be the next stage was when Richard Alpert came back as Ram Dass, and he was talking about getting high without chemicals through meditation, you know, solitude, and, and yoga practice, and all of that. 
what I find on this little tour that I'm on is that LSD has returned to our culture in such a major way. It's astonishing, and it's astonishing with young people. Uh, I had a, someone at the, this other reading I did who I asked, he's 23 years old, I asked him to explain microdosing. Right? And he said, well, you know, you take it in the morning and you feel good and you're happy. I said, isn't that coffee? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I don't get it, you know, especially uh, in the age of Trump. That we're <coughs> here into, the Pandora's box is open. Nobody's going to put the lid back on it. I'm just amazed at the level to which acid has become something that people care about again in this current day culture. Yes, sir. I'm curious to the, uh, the timeline of Alfred getting busted. Right. In two years seems like an extremely long sentence given what uh, is. Back then, in the 80s, I mean, what, was it scheduled yet? Was it you know what? It's a really good question. I, I was interviewed by somebody from Vice Media, God forgive me, a lovely human being, who said, Bob, I think I want to tell you, I did 21 years in federal prison for selling LSD. I said, dude, how big a deal? No, I went to dead shows. I sold some weed. I sold some acid. That came later, okay? The feds went quick, schedule one, yes, but when you got busted, and I think people will confirm this, I mean, Owsley dragged it out. He didn't go to prison for years after the bust because of all these deals and all this other stuff, but he got a three-year sentence, and he was sentenced with other guys who were making it with him. They all got three years in federal prison. So, I mean, I'm just also wondering the family, political connection, and maybe what you were alluding to being... No. No, the Sorry. grandfather was dead at that point. The father and he didn't talk. He had no help on. He had good lawyers, but he, he, he had a girlfriend who urged him to go to Canada, and he were, he was so American that he kind of said, "Well, I did the crime, and I'm going to go do the time." Okay, it, seems like it, was it seems like it was a lighter sentence. Only in retrospect, that's what he did back then. I mean, they got him with a size seven, seven or seven and a half grams of crystal uh, LSD before it had been made into. You know, so, but getting back to what you were saying before, I mean, LSD was, you know, really criminalized and, you know, turned into this nasty, horrible thing. But today, you know, I've been reading about the fact that, you know, there was so, there, there's efficacy about, in terms of mental health, in terms of... It's come back, they're trying to use it... To as you were alluding to, yes. but I mean, really important things I know. that, that should all be supporting in clinical trials that have been reintroduced. Albert Hoffman's first hit after he took acid on purpose was that it would be of use in therapeutic situations for psychiatric you know, patients. It, it, the problem with it, and they're using psilocybin with people who are dying, psilocybin's a lot more compact. It's a shorter duration. Acid is, <laughs> may I tell you, some serious stuff, okay? It's a, eight hours perhaps, depending on the dose. and So it's not so controllable, but yes, 50, Leary has a lot to answer. <laughs> he blew it up and he sold it so hard. He made it the panacea. So there were so many tragedies, people who were not prepared to take it, who had no idea what it was, killed themselves, killed, I mean, there was a lot of horror. But I think it's finally took Well, I sort years. of feel like it's being responsibly reintroduced. Coming back? Into these smaller doses. Yes, sir. Well, I, oh, this lady's yeah. next. Okay. I, I overlooked her twice. I was one of Ozzy's girlfriends among many. What's and your name? Elaine. Oh, wow. wow. And it was dur during the 60s. And he used to give me handfuls of acid all the time. He never well, there, there, well, there was a lot of but then yeah. there was one. Framed in, it was the purple Ozzy. It was the crown jewel of the of the whole museum. But yeah, it was the more modern stuff. But there, okay, so there is a museum. Thank you. Steve Gaskin was an ex-boyfriend. Steve Gaskin who was Monday night class. Yes. I, I gave Ashley. I interviewed Steve Gaskin in Las Vegas. What a group. We had ourselves. So I'm going to tell. Thank you. I'm going to tell a Barlow story. I'm not going to let Barlow tell the story. So Barlow and Mountain Girl, I don't have to tell you who that is. You know, they're, they're at uh, one of these Grateful Dead reunions at Red Rocks many years ago. Alpine Valley. Alpine Valley, I stand corrected. And Bear has some uh, acid that he hid in a tree trunk in Marin. Like, yeah. So here's Barlow here, and here's Mountain Girl, and they take this 
acid, and they're like really fucked up. Can I say that? Or it's no, no, we're we're fucked up. And Mountain Girl says to John, "We thought of ourselves as veterans, far past the point of getting that fucked up." Right. And Mountain Girl says to John, "Is they're fucking with us? What is it?" So they find Bear, who's also taken it, right? And they say, Bear, like, what the fuck? And Bear says, yeah, stuff's kind of gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're on your own, man. The, 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 the stuff had been in the fire. There had been an area that had got fire, and there had been, been a brush fire that came through there. And then Owsley took the acid out and recrystallized it. Okay. Then you make uh, this up? But what he came up with was... Uh, Something else. It had a lot of teeth and scales. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, first, a uh, story from Bill Thompson. I uh, was very lucky to meet. He told me that he visited. Manager of Jefferson Airplane. Uh, with uh, Kid Catalero. Uh -huh. He visited Owsley at Terminal Island. Uh -huh. um, it really doesn't matter what they were able to bring through security. It was the mere fact that when they produced a strip of 10 hits of acid from Owsley, he took them immediately and probably spent the next four days bouncing around his cell. And Bill Thompson was so proud of what they had done. Uh -huh. um, the, the question I have for you, sir, uh, besides thank you for all the great books I've read most of your time, thank you. Thank you. Did Brony Stanley's book give you a guide? Did you use it at all? I mean, she's not here tonight, is she? I was, I was so blown away <laughs> by her. I'm so blown away by her she description. She never his wife. She took his last name. They never met. Right, right. I, the process is just out, out of control. I mean, they're surgeons. Well, I am identified as Robert Greenwood in that book. I don't, you know, it's a finely made as I got anglicized. <laughs> <laughs> by getting uncircumcised. <laughs> I can pass now, you know. Robert Greenwood. Yeah. Uh, I don't want it, you know, I hate to cast this version. But I, I, I found that book rather dreadful. You know? I mean, I'll do it for you. I mean, the best thing about that book is that it tells you everything you need to know about how not to write a book about the guys I mean, she was there for all of it. A lot of the stuff holds up. I cross-checked it as best I could, you know, with dates and other people's books. And yeah, this really happened. And, you know, Hunter and the, the backstage with the dosing and all this kind of stuff. It's just the viewpoint is so you know what I mean? I, it's a, it makes him seem, to me, it made him seem like a horrible person. An awful human being. And he may have been an awful human being to her. But, but he, was, he was that among other things. He was that among other things. I mean, I encountered him later in his life where he had this kind of great sweetness about him. I don't know if he always had it. So, yes, sir. Did he ever have kids? Yes. Oh, yeah. He had two with two women who, you know. And then he has uh, expected his son to be here today to confront me once again about not having given him all the money for the book and then have not let him control the book. But he, didn't. he has a son named Starfinder. He's in Hawaii. And he has a daughter named Redbird. And They're all in Hawaii. Starfinder lives in California and Redbird lives in Australia. Yeah, well, they just went on vacation to Hawaii. I'm oh, that they're sure, like What do you think he would say about kids and taking out of people? You know, you don't really know what you've written until other people start writing about it. And somebody wrote about Owsley was not even a hippie. You, you said kids taking over? Kids. Yeah, just like, okay, 20 yeah, years or older. Was, what does this group say we should say they, to look, 20 they were, they were mixing a bathtub of acid-laced Kool-Aid. Kool and they Anybody was absolutely no age constraint on who came in and got a big cup. You know, the 60s were over the top. It's right. not like everything done was brilliant. But we're, we're like the elders looking back. And so what's the wisdom? Collective wisdom I don't think about Bear it. would have espoused it, you know? I, I I don't know what a kid is. I mean, what age are we talking? 20, 20 plus. Oh, fuck. You know, you're old enough to fight. You're old enough to take LSD. But yeah, as a parent, you say you really should in your life. Or I, you really urge should. That, I wouldn't urge any, I would never urge any kind of experience on anyone else. Because what good would that be? I have been given a time limit, which shocks me. End, but uh, we're getting close to it. I take one more question, two more questions. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed the book. Thank you. Um, you mentioned his diet <laughs> a couple times in the book. We did I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more okay. about the detail, the history, and if you came across any good 
or interesting research uh, while looking into it. Okay, so the more you talk, the weirder Bear gets. <laughs> Selvin is laughing because he knows how right this is. So Bear, uh, God knows, he gave various reasons. He said it was when he was wrestling at the military academy. He only ate meat. He ate an all-meat diet all the time. And when he took the dead to L.A., he refused to let them eat vegetables. He refused to let Bill Kreutzmann's daughter have oatmeal, okay? All meat, all the time, cooked rare and very rare. And then had a terrible bout of thyroid cancer, which he blamed on the fact that he'd ridden around in trucks and cars with Garcia and guys who smoked cigarettes claimed that the reason he beat the cancer was because cancers live on glucose and he had an all-meat diet, there was no starches in his body. <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> Sir? Yeah, uh, Owsley, did he ever talk about any experiences of being spiritual when he took the acid? Because when I read your book on Larry, which was very good, I was really astonished by how Someone like Leary and Grace Slick could take acid almost every day, not have any spiritual experiences, and then you look over at Ram Dass, and here's somebody who has. So is that the division between people, do you think? I don't know if it's the division between people. Bear did have, I don't know if you would call this a spiritual connection, but his text was the Kabbalion, which is this, uh, you know, odd book. Kind of, that's still in print, written by guys under a pseudonym. Uh, and I'm blanking on what it's actually, you know, uh, as above, so below. It's, uh, you know, the stuff that Crowley espoused as well. The, you know, alchemists. As Bear said, uh, alchemy Emerald was never. Emerald Pablo. Yes, that is, well, I don't know if that's in there, but it's not. Bear said, that, uh, you know, uh, alchemy was never trans transmutation of lead into gold. That was only when the church came in. It was a spiritual transformation. And that book kind of explained to him what he had experienced on LSD. I don't think he was particularly spiritual. He, he was so rational. Uh, that thinking brain was so immense that, you know, that often cuts out. It was kind of leery, too. He wasn't that, spiritual at all. Was, the only person I knew that seemed that was even less spiritual was Tim Leary. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, you just said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he never even he never mentioned Jung. Carl Jung didn't strike him then. What? The alchemy idea. You know, I, I love to quote Alan Watts on this. Alan Watts said, and I don't think he said it to Leary, once you get the answer, it's time to hang up the phone. So if you're taking LSD the way some guys are drinking whiskey, you're not doing it to have any kind of revelatory spiritual experience. I'm Oh, here she comes. Are Come on back. Well, we can take this one more short one. We no, I think we're one. done. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much.